one in your hymn books. this morning in glorious hope that you, the judge, shall come and take your servants to our eternal home. Lord, what a glorious future is ahead of us. And it's all because of you, and we bow now to acknowledge that and to rejoice in you. Lord, you know our hearts, you know the heaviness you know the confusion that can creep into our hearts. You know our needs. And Lord, I rejoice that you've given your spirit to minister in our lives and that your ways are perfect. Lord, we rejoice that we're able to be here today, that we have the liberty to meet. And we rejoice that you have a plan and purpose for our meeting today and that you are at work in our lives. So Lord, all because of, of the Redeemer that you've sent. We rejoice in our fellowship with you today and our fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and we trust that your heart will be rejoicing in the truth of who God is. <clears throat> I invite you to turn to number 190. Number 190, let's sing, There is a Redeemer, number 190. 
yourself. 
Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. <clears throat> Let's sing number 475. Number 475, Rejoice in the Lord. Last week, Romans 1 through 11 are the instructions doctrinally laying the foundation. And Romans 12 through 16 are the practical outworking of it. So, Romans 1 through 11, Paul is sharing with us about the mercies of God in our salvation and the mighty working of God. And last week we saw in chapter 12, because of God's mercies, our life should be transformed. And a transformed life is not about us. A transformed life is to live for God in His program, we mentioned last week. It's a transformed life lives to serve the body. We are transformed so that we love fellow believers and 
even those who are against us, and that's just a brief summary of Romans 12. The transformed life will be manifested in this. So now he goes on in chapter 13, and he shares that a transformed life will be properly related to authorities. And we'll look at that today. And um, I thought, God's timing is perfect, isn't it? I mean, in where we're at in our nation right now, and um, this may create some questions as, as much as it does answers. And um, in Sunday school this morning, the adult Sunday school will follow up on, on this. But we need, to, we need to kind of set the framework. The early church that this was written to was not only in a world that was full of hostility, but it was a very hateful world, in particular, to those that were followers of Jesus Christ. Um, we find Paul in his epistles, Peter in his, um, addressing these issues, and, and there was often the case that um, individuals living at that time would be led to believe that anything that is earthly is, is evil, so we don't need to mess with it, and, and anything that is spiritual is not of this earth, and they would apply that politically, and they would apply that to the point of saying, um, we don't need to obey, and we don't need to be involved, and it's immaterial to us. And, and so, um, they not only were living in a situation like that, but they were living in a situation that the government was, was very, very evil. The emperor of Rome, from... A.D. 54 to 68, at the time of this, was a man simply known as Nero. The emperor was not known in any measure for being a godly person. He, gained, he lived his life in a perpetual state of illicit acts, homosexual marriage being one of them. In A.D. 64, the great Roman fire occurred, with Nero himself being suspected of having started it as an act of, of arson. But to get rid of that report, the report that he started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures of class hatred and abominations on whom he called Christians. And there was inexplainable persecution of believers during this time. And it was during the reign of Nero that, that Paul wrote this epistle. Now, in the Roman local church, which was predominantly Gentiles, Yet there were some Jewish members of the church, as we've already seen. He's addressed certain matters concerning that. But the Jews in the, in the Roman Empire were notoriously bad citizens. They, they weren't coming under this government. They saw it as corrupt, and they were not coming under it. And... Um, they based that on Deuteronomy 17.15, that to acknowledge a Gentile ruler was sinful. Now, that's their background, that's the atmosphere that this letter is coming in. And um, so these, some of these Jews have the attitude, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? And, um, and it was easy to fall into a spirit of anarchy, that no one rules over us. And so 
Paul is writing in the practical sense, if we are transformed, this is how it should show up in our lives. And, and he's addressing that, and that's where he goes into how it shows up in our lives in relation to those that rule over us. Now, we lay a little groundwork here regarding government. Number one, we understand that God designed all nations and God designed government. Government was not man's idea. Nations, well, we begin with nations. The beginning of nations goes back to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And God separated the language and he separated the nations. If you want to be even more technical, it goes back to Abraham. He said, I will raise up you a nation. So, God had his hand in nations. The institution of human government goes back to Genesis 9 when after the flood God told Noah to establish and this is human government to establish that if someone takes one's life their life is to be taken and he established that as human government. I, I don't have time this morning to go into that but it's, it's foundational that we realize nations are God's design, and human government is God's design. Now, Paul jumps right in here and he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Secondly, God expects his people to obey human governments. And he says, if you resist this, therefore, he, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those that resist will bring judgment on themselves. And he goes on and he gives two reasons why we should submit to authorities. To avoid punishment, to avoid their wrath, they don't carry the sword in vain. They have the authority to bring punishment. That's one reason. And secondly, to have a clear conscience. So he says, understand, Proverbs 21.1, God puts down and raises up, and the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it however he wants. And he says, I understand you're under Nero right now and all of that, but he said, this is our sovereign God over all things. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13, Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Again, the same situation that who Peter was writing to, they were facing the same persecution and, and evil rulers over them. So, God designed nations and government. God expects his people to obey human government. Let me just add, thirdly, God expects his people to pray for human authorities. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. He wrote to young Timothy and he says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. But then he narrows it down. For kings and for them who are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So, he expects us. And there are, I don't know if we'll have the time to get into it, but there are a lot of responsibilities that he calls us to do. But first and foremost, it is to pray. We need to ask ourselves what our prayer life is like. 
for those that we totally agree with compared to those that we totally disagree with. Now, what we ask of God may be different, but the fervency and the frequency of our prayers should never be different. And, and if there if there is one of probably many issues among Christianity, it is we have failed to pray for those that rule over us. And, and as a result, um, we bear the consequences. Now, the questions always come up. Okay, is it ever right? for a Christian to disobey his government. Now, the book of Acts gives us examples of this. Um, throughout other epistles, we find examples of it. And the bottom line of this principle is this. Obedience to God always takes precedence over obedience to man. Remember in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, Peter and the other apostles were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their lives had been transformed. And, and they commanded them, we're going to let you go, but do not preach the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, they said later, after they arrested them again, they said, we commanded you not to preach the name of Jesus Christ. And now you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. So, they were not obeying their authorities. Why? Because they had a higher command. Amen. God told them to proclaim the gospel. And government said, do not proclaim the gospel. And they obeyed God, and they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. And the Bible has many other examples. The Hebrew midwives, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, a Christian must disobey the government when it asks him to violate a command of God, when it asks him to commit an immoral or unethical act, which would be a violation of the law of God, or commands him to go against his Christian conscience as it is informed by Scripture and submission to the Spirit of God. So, the areas that we're tempted to disobey the government, do we have biblical grounds in order to do that? And, and it's an important question that we ask. And so I want to back up a little bit here and, and remind us of a couple things. The chief end of man is to glorify God that we should be to the praise of his glory. That, that is a universal, unchanging goal that God has for every human being. But in particular, for we as believers, the purpose we are here is to glorify God. Now, we glorify God Simplifying it, we glorify God by living a Christ-like life and proclaiming the gospel regardless the government we are under. Okay? So, let's illustrate it. This is the chief end of man, to glorify God. How do I do that? I'm living in this sinful world. I do that by... Causing my life to be like Christ. This is Romans. He's already talked about a progressive sanctification. We are 
we are becoming more like Christ. And the more you are like Christ, the more God will be glorified. So, being more like Christ, and secondly, which you could say it comes under being like Christ, but proclaiming the gospel. Okay? So, here I am. My chief end is to glorify God. And I do that by reading the Bible, obeying the Bible, fellowshipping with believers, serving, praying. I become like Christ. I'm growing to be more like Christ. And while I'm doing that, I'm looking for opportunities to plant the seed of the gospel. Now, in a peaceful and quiet society, that is much more enjoyable. That is good and acceptable in the sight of God. It says in Timothy, pray for them that rule over you. And he said that you may dwell in peace. And this is good and acceptable will of God. And he goes right on. Turn there. Turn to again to Second Tim. I mean, First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. Where he said for us to pray for them that rule over us. For this is good and acceptable. Verse 3. In the sight of God our Savior. Who desires all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom to be testified in due time. How did he... He tied this, pray for your authorities that you may lead a quiet and peaceable life, and he ties it right in with God desires mankind to be saved. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. How did he tie that all in? The chief end of man is to glorify God. You do that by living a godly life and proclaiming the gospel and... Ideally, it'd be good to do that in a quiet and peaceable society. But, if it is not, and we have been blessed to be able to have that. Amen. I don't know how, how much we've taken advantage of it to become Christ-like and proclaim the gospel or to heap it upon ourselves to enjoy the quiet and peaceful life. But God's chief end of us to glorify God does not change if the quiet and peaceable life changes. My, my purpose in this life is to glorify God by pursuing Christ's likeness and proclaiming Christ even if it is outlawed. Which Peter and Paul and all of them had. Do you see what do you see what we're saying here? Regardless of the government we are under, we still have the same purpose in life. Now, let's take a vote. Who would like a quiet and peaceable? Let's have it that way. Absolutely. But God is in control, and maybe we would become more like Christ and proclaim the gospel, and maybe people would be more receptive to the gospel if we don't have a quiet and peaceable life. Well, I don't like those apples. I don't either. But, God knows what's best for us. And in the same book of Romans that we like to cherry pick out, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And we think that means, that means he's going to make everything quiet and peaceable. No. He goes on and says, for whom he did foreknow, 
he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many creatures. So God is at work to make us like Christ. And he's able to take all these things and use them in our life to glorify him, even if it includes blatant fraud, evil, lies, deception, and corrupt, God-hating governments. I'm just like you. I don't like hearing that either. But it's a reality. Your goal and my goal in life does not change with the governments that may change. We are here as ambassadors of God. And, and, and a perfect example of this is, is Daniel. Daniel was a man, young man, that was taken from his culture and taken into a wicked, um, evil culture and was trained in that culture. And when they wanted to frame Daniel, they said, the only way we can get him is if it has something to do with his religion. Amen. They, they weren't able to say, oh, I, I heard Daniel out there the other day, man, he was bad mouth in the cave. No. They said, we have nothing we can find on Daniel. He is of an excellent spirit. Amen. So if we're going to get him, it's going to have to be with something with him and his God. Glorifying God. So let's make a, a let's get the king to make a law that you can only pay, pray to the king and whatever he sets up as God. Yeah, that'd be great. So they did. They passed it. And Daniel said, my life purpose has never changed. Amen. I'm here to glorify God. And to do that, I need to talk to him at least three times a day. And so Daniel went to talk to God. And he bore the consequences of it. Amen. And we like the story of Daniel that, yeah, God protected him in the lion's den. Well, you know what? For every one Daniel, there's probably ten others you read about in Hebrews 11. Some were committed to following Christ, and they were sawn asunder, it says in Hebrews 11. Some wandered in deserts and famine, but they said, if I am to glorify God in this, God, so be it. I want to glorify you. Amen. If you're using this in my life to make me like you, so be it. If this is a way that you want me to proclaim Jesus Christ, amen. So be it. Our goal, our mission, never changes. And that's why Peter wrote, We greatly rejoice, though now for a season we have heaviness through this trial of faith. But this trial of faith will be much more precious than of gold. See, there's many of us that have heaviness anticipating the trial of faith that is about to come, right? We're not even in the trial of faith yet. And, and Peter says, you're in a trial of faith, but he says, God's using it to purify you. And this will be, make you, this will be much more precious than of gold that perishes. Comfortable people do not need Jesus. Amen. Desperate people do. Yes. <laughs> and maybe God is changing up our government because we haven't been doing a very good job of representing him. 
because he knows maybe he's allowing all this upheaval and change because he knows it will give us a platform to proclaim Christ. It will purify us, this trial of faith that we'll be going through, this difficult time. But you can count on this, that God knows what he's doing. He hasn't forsaken his own. And he is still having the same goal that he had 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It's always the same. I want you, us, to glorify God. And like I said, man, I prefer to do it with no persecution. But you know what? That's in God's hands. There's a lot of people in Nigeria today that would prefer to serve God and become Christ-like and proclaim the gospel without persecution. But they're seeing family members snatched away and killed. They're seeing whole villages wiped out, even as we speak here today. I don't understand it all. But I know someday we will, and I know God's purpose for us has not changed. Our goal and our mission never changes. Now, we may talk about it later. I, I don't have the time to go into it now. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. We need to, we need to honor and obey our authorities. We need to pray for our authorities. We need to use our liberties to influence others for right. We need to, to do what we can to encourage righteous living. Righteousness exalts a nation. So we ought to do what we can. I'm, I'm not going to go into all that here today. But, for me this week, this was, this was very timely. In understanding, wait a minute God, your purpose for me hasn't changed one bit. And how have I been doing it? It ought to make us examine. Have, has it been my goal to be Christ-like? Or has it been my goal to be safe? Has it been my goal to preserve um, prosperity? Man, I like good things. I like being able to eat all these different varieties, man. I don't want to go be like Venezuela. I don't. Neither do you. But you know what? That's not top priority with God. Amen. Christ likeness and proclaiming Christ is the top priority. And he says then, and he ties this together, in, and we think it's almost like a drastic change, like all oh, double clutches, shifts gears, and he goes into a different phrase. Notice verse 8. Owe no man anything but except to love the brethren. So he's saying, regardless of what government you're under, Christ likeness and preaching Christ, and you don't want to provide a stumbling block because you love others, your brethren and the lost, you don't want to provide a stumbling block. You do nothing, it says here. Love does no harm to his neighbor. So, Daniel's contemporaries were not able to say, yeah, that Daniel, he says he serves a different God and everything, but he's lazy at work and he's gossiping. And he's complaining. You hear he took advantage of this person? No. Amen. Why? Because Daniel loved even the wicked. They, Daniel did no harm to anyone else. Amen. And Paul's saying, we need, we need to be modern citizens. Yes. Doesn't mean you don't stand for what is right. 
But we need to not provide a stumbling block to others because the most important thing is that people know Jesus Christ. The most important thing is that we glorify God. And so he ties it all in and he tells us nothing is to stop us from showing Christ's love. And then he, he, he talks about this. Love fulfills the law. You don't, you don't have to worry about what are the laws, what, what does God tell me. If you love someone, you're not going to do them harm. So lying to them is doing them harm. It's deceiving them. Committing adultery is doing them harm. All of this. Love does what is best for the one love. Well, man, some of these people in our lives, some of these authorities that are in our lives, it is impossible for me to love them. Amen, it is. And you know what, you want to be the honest truth? It's impossible for you to love anybody but yourself apart from God. And that's why we must put off the works of darkness, he said. Wake up, and God's shaking us. Wake up. Now is our salvation nearer than it's ever been. And we need to put off the works of darkness and put on the armor. You don't have armor to sit in a lazy boy. You have armor to go to battle. Mm -hmm. And put on the armor of light and make no provision for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means every time I'm filled with anger towards someone or anyone or anything, I need to say, God, I need your spirit. I need your power. I need your love because I want to glorify you. And when I don't walk in love, I do not glorify God. And love is not lovey-dovey. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Oh, you're evil. That's wonderful. God love you. God. No, love speaks the truth. But it speaks the truth not to destroy people, but to bring them to Christ. Amen. And we lose sight. I lose sight. It's all about being like Christ to bring them to Christ. And, and I pray I would love a quiet and peaceable life. You want to know the truth? We don't deserve a quiet and peaceful life. And the reality is that God deals with nations in this world. And we deserve the most severe judgment. And, and throughout history, you look at nations and the fall of nations, and we're marching in a steady beat to all of us. But that doesn't change, as a believer, your purpose and my purpose. Stephen, they, they loved Stephen's message when he gave Jewish history. He was given in, in Acts chapter 7 this great, you want a quick lesson in Jewish history, read Acts chapter 7. But then he came dealing with sin and says, you are like your fathers and you are the one that killed the Messiah. Then they picked up stones and gnashed on him with their teeth and killed him. And Stephen looked up. And what was the chief purpose? To glorify God. And he glorified God. And you read in the Bible that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Standing out of respect, if you please. Why? 
He fulfilled the chief end of man. Amen. Stephen could have said, oh man, I'm sorry. That wasn't politically correct. I'll apologize on national television. I'll apologize on Twitter. I'll apologize on Parler if they haven't removed all those from the, the airway. I'll do all those things. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, he said, this is truth. Amen. And if it's truth, I'll die on it to glorify God. Amen. And we have to come to where we believe what is truth. I have a lot of preferences in my life. And next week we'll get to the difference about preferences. But there's very little that I'll die for. Oh, you know, when, when you're not in the bad Lord, you know. <laughs> but do we love God enough that no matter what happens, my goal is to glorify you? You know, that, that's the bottom line. And, and it's a dilemma, and, and we'll talk more about it in Sunday school, but it's a dilemma. I'm a citizen of this world, but I'm a citizen of heaven. And there's there's a conflict between those. We ought to be a blessing to this world. We ought to help and build up and stand for righteousness. And, and many times our Christian faith will cause us to stand against what is politically correct. And take positions that are unpopular. But that's when we have to come back and say, you know what? Whatever the case may be, I am committed to standing with God. And we need never come to a point of despair of, oh man, peace and quiet is ending. And, and one, we don't know what the future holds. But regardless of what it holds... God reigns over all the nations of the earth. You read in the book of Psalms there and in Isaiah, they are as drops in the bucket. Not drops. He called a drop in the bucket. Yeah. One drop. And the one enthroned in heaven laughs at all those who rage against him. No matter who controls the house, or the Senate, or the White House, God is still on the throne. Amen. And it doesn't matter how they got there, or how long they'll be there, we need to be reminded, God is still on the throne, and His purpose for you as a believer, and His purpose for me as a believer, has not changed. Amen. And it will not change, though the climate of our, our culture may change drastically. And that's why it says, I, I've called you in this world that doesn't know what love is to show true godly love. And the only thing you should ever be obligated to anyone Amen. is obligated to God to love them because of how much he's loved you. Yes. That is our calling. Heavenly Father, we are unworthy. We are unable to live up to this calling, and we need your empowerment. Lord, you know our hearts. You know how prone we are to despair and fear and anxiety and, and rebellion and justification of selfish living and on and on. But Lord, would would you? will work in every one of us as believers that we genuinely would die to self and live to you that it's, it's no longer about us and Lord that we would not put a stumbling block in anyone's path that would, would hinder them from coming to you Lord that we would have an excellent spirit like Daniel Lord, that you would be glorified in our lives as you were through Daniel's life. So, Lord, we do 
plead your mercies. We pray if there's anyone here that has never responded to your gift of love in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, that today your spirit would draw them to you and they would say yes. Lord, again, you know our hearts. You know what we're struggling with even now. But Lord, I pray that you would show your power through us to supernaturally transform us to be indeed like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.